here. Here. I'm here. Uh, we're looking for a motion to excuse Councilwoman Richmond and Councilman Pierce, please. So moved. Support. A motion. We have support. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? They are excused. Uh, we have a spot on our agenda now, and we have a spot on our agenda at the end of the meeting for public comments. So if anyone would like to address the council, they may do so now or at the end of the meeting. Do we have anyone? Seeing none, we'll move into our consent agenda. I will be considered to be routine. We'll take that with one motion, unless someone on council or someone in the audience wants it removed for further discussion or clarification. Tonight on our consent agenda, we have our minutes of February 24th, planning commission minutes of February 3rd, rec board minutes of January 8th, housing commission minutes of February 11th, BPU minutes February 5th, BPU financial reports for January, our financial reports for January, and a memo for me regarding some appointments for reappointments. Uh, those are the items on our consent agenda tonight. Would anyone in the audience like anything to move? Anyone at council? Yes, I would like the board so we look for a motion to no other. We look for a motion to approve consent agenda, consent agenda items one through seven. So move support. We have a motion of support. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carried. Uh, number eight is the number regarding board appointments. Uh, Council Richmond? Yes, um, I just have a quick question. I know in our Charter and um, send the other clarification where it states in a portion of it regarding where um, civilian appointees can't sit on more than one board. Um, what was emailed back to me was there was an attorney appointed me some time ago that those were only in relationships to the library and the recreation board. Um, I would like to have a discussion about having that apply to all of our board commissions. Where, um, one individual should only sit on one of those boards, efficient directors. Okay. And, uh, and the, the double appointment would be Terry Boga, realizing you could do that the Brownfield, we can certainly have that discussion. Yeah. Very legitimate question. The Brownfield board meets very rarely. In fact, does anyone know when the last time that board met? 1951. <laughs>
And midway down one of those paragraphs that begins with each of such boards, it says, except as otherwise provided by this charter, no person shall serve on more than one board of the city. The terms of the members shall be for five years and shall be so arranged so that one member of each board shall expire in each year. Um, the opinion that I read this afternoon from 2004 was that the paragraph commences with the statement each of such boards and refers to those two boards that were created in the charter. It does not address the many boards that have come into being under statute. And as you know, some of those boards under statute, like ELEDPA, have uh, required positions uh, on them. They, they require officers from different uh, city, governing bodies and county in some cases. And uh, I would say that at this point, from my point of view, the paragraph begins each of such boards. And it has, that is right below the creation of the two boards, the library board and the recreation board. Um, as far as I know, uh, people have been appointed to multiple boards for in excess of two decades. I, don't know, I did not have the time to go back and research when different boards came into being, or whether they all follow the pattern of five members, each of whom serves for five years, I don't think that they do, but, um, so as far as evaluating every board against this provision in the charter, I'm not prepared to speak to that, but I do believe that the par that paragraph definitely begins each of such boards, uh, and, re and the only boards that are mentioned here are the library board. So my response is to support the opinion for 2004. Okay. It would be nice to know, we do not want, again, the same person serving on major boards. I don't think we, I, I'd be curious at how many we, Brownfield, Lift Up, are a little different than Planning Commission, Recreation, maybe DDA. I would, I guess I'd like a little more information before we change our practice. <coughs> We don't have multiple people serving on multiple city boards. That does not have, we have some examples, but I, so I'm not defending it. I'm more than willing to talk about changing it, but I guess I'd like to know what, how many duplicates we really have. And are they uniquely, if that's okay with you, could we do a little research and bring this back to the future? Yes, no. yes please. Is that great? Any other input from anybody? I, I would maybe suggest that we do a mild audit of yeah. our boards, look at compliance, and then also review the language on the other boards to see if or if not any of that does apply, if it's repetitious or not, and get us a better handle to make sure that we don't, or we are complying with it as best we can, or we are armed. Well, and again, not to make excuses, but it's a, it's a difficult job trying to talk citizens into serving on a lot of these boards are not that uh, rewarding, they're, they're, you're doing it for service, but, but uh, so I don't, I do all these appointments or make a lot of them, and I don't, can't recall many duplicates. And maybe we need to make that policy though, so it's not just accidentally. I, I, I we're all more than willing to look at it. If that's, uh, so we, we do some analysis over the next few weeks and bring back a kind of a summation and bring it up again and maybe a month. Is that okay? Yeah, I appreciate that. Yes, thank you. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. I would be curious if we do have a lot of duplicates. I just suspect we don't, but it's good to look at it. That being said, are we okay with that? Can we get a motion then to approve item 8 on the agenda? So Support. We have a motion. I have support. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Very close. <coughs> motion carried. Number 9, bills and accounts. Tonight we're being asked to approve $143,486. Tom is here. Jeffrey's here. I think Tom's here. Yeah. Anybody have any questions for down the street? Not a motion pair. Those would be nice. We would pay the bills. Support. We have a motion, we have support. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Everybody opposed? Motion carried. Number 10, City Manager Report. Keith. Thank you, Your Honor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, first, we'd like to make note that there was a, an error, a typo, in the 2020 property tax assessment notices that uh, recently were sent out to our property owners. Uh, there is a value that uh, is referenced as 1.029 instead of 1.19, uh, except for the fact that the actual value calculations are correct, uh, but the multiplier should have been referenced as 1.019. If 
there are any questions, if any property owners have a question related to that. So the values are correct. There's a typo in the uh, notice, and it actually represents a, a lower value. Uh, but if you have any questions about that, we want to uh, direct those to our city assessor's office. Secondly, we'd like to uh, welcome. She's been on the. She's been in in place for a couple of weeks, but we'd like to welcome Sue Aldinger to uh, the receptionist position at the, uh, in the City Hall here, the Henry L. Brown Municipal Building. Uh, she replaces recently retired Cheryl Robinson. Uh, Sue has worked for the last several years as a, on a part-time basis with the, uh, the Recreation Center, the Robert W. Brown Recreation Center. So look forward to Sue being with our team full-time and welcome her to the building. We want to let our residents know that uh, they may notice work going on on North Michigan Avenue, which will eventually work its way down South Michigan Avenue and uh, Park Street as well uh, by ITC. ITC trucks are in and around Michigan Avenue. Currently, they're replacing wooden electrical poles with uh, metal electrical poles as part of the upgrade to their infrastructure and uh, transmission lines. And so we just want to make the residents aware that that will be underway or is underway and that will be, um, work will continue through the course of the summer. Ultimately, this is to help culminate in having the third redundant source of power to our electric system, um, and it also interconnects uh, some of our various uh, substations, including the newest one on Butters Avenue, which will also be under construction this summer. Uh, secondly, just a reiteration, uh, we've mentioned this a couple times, but uh, this, the city's uh, email server uh, will be discontinued in a couple months and so we'll be uh, just making aware of that and that's just email that's no other services that's just email and the vpu does have staff that can help um, customers transition from the um, cbpu.com email address to a different email address and then a couple uh, positive notes the city is participating in a couple of grants, or has received a couple of grants, the first of which is through the St. Joseph River Watershed Water Quality Project Grant. It's a long name, uh, but what it does is it's, it's almost an extension of the work that we did last year with the tree inventory. Uh, this is actually with the same company, uh, the St. Joseph River Watershed uh, organization is sponsoring this. Uh, the city, what the city gets out of it is quite a bit of technical assistance, a report on, this, on the urban canopy, as well as 50 trees to plant as part of a community project later this year. So just the value of the trees is seven to $8,000, and we'll be doing a planting blitz in the fall of this year. And there'll be more information to follow, but uh, we are one of six communities selected <coughs> the St. Joseph River watershed, uh, the Coldwater River and the lakes that join us uh, eventually reached the St. Joe River, and so that's why we were incorporated into that project. And then lastly, uh, part of the Mr. Grant that resulted in the construction of the home at Semiport Thompson, uh, we also received $40,000 for single family residential repairs and other upgrades in the neighborhood immediately surrounding that. So we'll be notifying those neighbors uh, within that area that, um, that that program is eligible and seek participants for that. And that's my report. Keith, could you elaborate a little bit on the mission grant? <coughs> it says you need a strong area. We're talking within so many feet or anywhere in that. So in our in our grant application, we identified essentially from Smith to Sealy to Morse to um, so our trail trail village is the west or the east side. So so it incorporates Central Park Drive, Sealy, Smith, some of the side streets off of that Morse. And are you guys considering? Or I guess what what the type of improvements you're considering? use that funds for? So the grant allows up to $7,500 and it could be any type of exterior repairs. Um, Is that Bronson received a similar grant um, earlier this year, late last year, and um, now the, the participants have to meet a certain income qualification as well, uh, but they could be, and it, it is a grant to the, to the residents, so they're getting more information to follow, and we'll get um, applications uh, 
made available to those that are interested. But it would be a grant. It's to, to homeowners within that um, defined area, and it's uh, up to seventy five hundred dollars for exterior repairs. And we administrated that in general, and we make the decision on who gets. Yes. And so, like exterior, so roofs, windows, siding, painting, yep. reimbursement, yep. porches. Storm doors, uh, etc. Things. Is that a loan or is that a grant? Right. That's a straight loan. Yep. Yeah. And is it exterior facing the road? I'm assuming you can't do stuff in like the rear yard. No, but it's it's exterior. Obviously, we're trying to. The, the intent of this this money is to help solidify or um, the, the appear both the appearance standpoint, but also the, the physical maintenance of the of the home. Do so. you know the income eligibility? No, it's on top of my head. But that will be on the website, this information? Yep, we'll get it out. Um, we were just notified last week, so I uh, just wanted to make we'll reference to it. So I wasn't going to hear that internally. Maybe so, D, yeah, D. And then who's going to make the decisions on who gets how much? So it will come, they'll, the homeowners will have to apply. They'll have to essentially be able First, what, what other communities have done has been a first come, first serve process. Um, they meet qualifications, they have to get three bids, and then um, once they get awarded that, then they can go get notified by the city. But is that really the first come, first serve is how it works as opposed to a deadline for application? And then, I mean, is that, that's what most communities do, they do a first come, first serve? I believe so. In, in announcing in announcing this, I wasn't quite prepared for the for, for all the for all the details, but uh, we'll get that in front of you as well. As you got prior to rolling it out, we'll make a recommendation on how to be dispersed. Yeah. Yeah. definitely based on this conversation. Keep so. <laughs> yeah. question on the CDP email. This has been notice has been given several times. Has there been a decrease or a lot of disappears or still quite a few? Thank you. So there's roughly around 300 people or so actively using that, give or take. Sometimes we can only monitor when they access it. So you might still have an active account, but you didn't access it for the last six months, but you still have want that account. So it's a little bit hard to judge. How long are active with those 300? Yeah, it's about 300 active, but most everybody's been notified. This is the first official notification that we've actually sent out because we're actually trying to uh, make sure that we had all our ducks in a row. So at this point, it just doesn't make sense. Question on the city manager report. Uh, not a motion to approve this in order. Motion to approve. Support. We have a motion to support. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Very close. Report accepted. Uh, number 11, it's with uh, deep regret. I speak for most of us, if not all of us, that we've uh, had a letter from Councilman Chris Pierce uh, tendering his resignation from City Council for personal reasons. Um, I, uh, Chris has served on this council for over 20 years, and uh, again, I'll speak for myself, but I think he most of you have served his uh, citizens and the people in the second ward very admirably, and he will be missed. Uh, with that being said, uh, our normal procedure, if it's acceptable to everyone, is the council person in the ward will be collecting resumes, applications, interest in filling the term, which I believe is almost over a year, almost a year and a half, if not a little more, until the next city election. Right, next November. This fall in November. A year from now. Yeah. So, uh, a rather long term. So, if anyone those of anyone in the second ward is interested, we would urge them to counsel, contact Councilman Kanak. I'd also ask uh, Don if they would please uh, and, and, uh, specify that in an article that any interest parties are urged to contact Councilman Kanak, and then he will gather uh, names and come back to us in a, as quickly as he can with a recommendation. It's up to us to. Uh, Point, but we have traditionally accepted the recommendation of the council. So it's a lot on his uh, prison shoulders. Shoulder, so, uh, so anyway, it's an important thing. And uh, anybody interested, please get a hold of the council if you're not. So we do, unfortunately, need a 
motion and a second to accept the recognition of Chris Pierce. And we'll make the motion. Support that. Okay. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carried. Uh, number 12, letter from Keith Baker regarding the electric utility system revenue bonds. We plagiarized Jeff's memo, so I'll let Jeff speak to <laughs> you. Thank you, Your Honor, City Council. Uh, in front of you is the bond ordinance. Uh, at this point, we are looking to go and sell bonds for two purposes. The first one is to finance the construction of the, Butters Electric, or the proposed Butters Electrical Substation. Uh, that is uh, five and a half million dollars. Um, is what we're looking to borrow. Uh, they have bond, we actually leave tomorrow for our bond rating, so the bonds will be sold sometime around either late April, early May, is when we expect to finance those. Uh, especially now, uh, we're actually getting the market at probably the best time ever, uh, because obviously the historical rates have dropped again. Uh, we're looking at rates that'll probably one and a half percent interest rate for, and that's the, that's the net interest cost for about 20 years. Uh, hindsight, which is one for 40 years. Uh, so again, these bonds are being sold at historically low interest rate environment. Uh, it doesn't get any better than this in order to borrow money. Your 401k suffer, but other than that, uh, it's good for the city and the BPU. The second half of that is actually $11.8 million. We're requesting that is to finance the, the sale. And I say that loosely because we've always owned it. We've always paid 100% of the cost. And all that does is move the debt from the Michigan South Central Power Agency over to the balance sheet of the board of board public utilities. There is no increased operating cost. This is purely just moving that debt over to our books off their books. Uh, it does a couple, of, it has significant benefits to both projects. Uh, but uh, again, with that, being, with that answering questions, I know we've talked about this in the past, uh, but with that answering questions you would have. What is project four? Oh, I'm sorry. Project four is a natural gas plant on Butters Avenue. Uh, this was that that was done at a bank rate uh, wasn't done on the open Fillmore market. Road. Yep, Fillmore Road. Thank you. That's a that's a question. Yeah, Fillmore Road. Uh, it's the natural gas, 13 megawatt natural gas plant uh, that operates. You know, not often, but it's usually there for capacity. Uh, but this really moves that uh, from from one balance sheet to the other balance sheet. I do want to point out the differences. Is there are two series? Uh, there's an A and a B. The A is our typical tax exempt bonds. The B Bonds are being sold tax exempt, or excuse me, taxable. That is being done for just in case we ever want to hook up to the greenhouse for the CO2 and the heat. Uh, but that gives us some flexibility, or if it ever, for some unlikely reason, ever was sold, uh, that it would be uh, easier to get out of that being a taxable. Uh, the difference is about 50 basis points or 60 basis points, or half a percent. Uh, difference between the two rates, so we are paying a little bit, but again, with rates so as if you had told me I had less than 2% interest rates a year ago, I would have jumped up and down. So uh, we anticipated 4% of years to do this. Other questions? Okay. So the only new money is to redo the substation? Okay. Technically, they're both new money, I want to be clear, but, but it's really, but it's never been formally through the bond process on the, through the agency sold. But yes, the only new money is really, because we've always been responsible 100% for that debt. The only new money is for the Butters Street substation. What is the Butters Avenue substation? Is that a new facility? This is be a new facility. A new yeah. facility. A new facility. And what that does, uh, there's several benefits. Most of them are operational. Uh, we'll be able to, uh, to uh, right now we're a little overloaded at times in the summertime, so it'll take the loading and spread the load evenly. Uh, there'll also be some operational issues. It'll give us, you know, like if I wanted to, turn power off and send it to one place if there's a break or you know, operation to do some things of that nature. Uh, the other nice thing is also add capacity for any expansion out there. Uh, so it really makes it, because with the greenhouse, they fill out, you know, that is on a separate transmission ring, but it's all the other school that goes out there. And the fact that the consumers bill, what is that, you know? Well, consumers, we, uh, we don't have a consumers bill. <laughs> well, I'm joking. Yeah, that's the, uh, uh, it, it really is built into the rate, so there's no immediate impact. I, I can't, I don't have it quantified. Then would it be a rate hike on the bond payment? The, there, I don't see a rate hike. We're still working on revenue neutral hikes. I mean, at some point, there, I mean, it's obviously adding interest expense, uh, but it's something that we need to do in order to grow the system. Thank you. Any questions for Jeffrey? Ah, they're looking for us to introduce and adopt. Motion to introduce and 
adopt our victory. Support. We have support. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carried. Thank you, John. Thank you. Number 13, which this will be a of a roll call vote, is a letter from Keith regarding the sale of 25 Munson Street. Uh, Keith, want to just refresh our memories? Yes, thank you, Your Honor. So back on January 27th, uh, you placed this as first reading for the proposed sale of 25 Munson uh, to Ted and Amy Short. Uh, they offered five thousand dollars for the property. Uh, the property is was uh, purchased by the city through the state tax foreclosure process. Uh, it's now set on the table for over thirty days, as required by charter. And uh, while we did have a couple people, as a result of the, the media coverage after the first meeting, uh, they took a look at it, and, and nobody else has expressed interest or offered any uh, subsequent offer on the property to compete against the short offer. So with that, we're seeking your consideration of approval of Resolution 2008 and Agreement Number 2002. Thank you, Dr. Sorry. Any final questions? With the clerk, please take the vote. Council Member Yes. 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 Motion carried. Number 14, letter from Keith regarding the Mishta MOD home grant amendments. Thank you, Your Honor. As part of the grant that resulted in the construction of the home at 74 Thompson Boulevard, uh, Mishta, through the course of that time, uh, since adoption of the original agreement, has loosened up or made more flexible their income requirements for persons interested in purchasing uh, this uh, this property or any subsequent property if they were to be financed in a similar way. And this is not only affecting us, but affecting the other 10 communities that, um, that participated in the program. So what this does is make it, uh, it increases the the income limit by which someone could purchase our house. So up to four person households, they would have to, their income would have to be less than 73,320. And for five or more, they could actually make up to 96,840. Uh, but to implement that, we need a change in our grant agreement with MISHTA. And that's what this does uh, through the uh, adoption of resolution 2010. So this is, freeing up, making more flexible, or increasing the range of the incomes by which someone could purchase that house. What was the original income? So the original income was $73,320 for uh, a four-person home, but there was prorated amounts for lower numbers of persons. So it was in the 60s for a three-person home, it was in the 50s for a two-person home. And similarly, it went up, so for five thousand, for five-person, uh, household, it was, I believe, at 78 or 79, um, and then went up from there per person in the household. So, what it really does is it makes the limits higher for a smaller number of households. Um, for those five, six, or seven uh, member households, uh, it's a higher income limit, and for uh, one, two, or three person households, it's a higher income limit for them to be able to uh, purchase that building. We've had a lot of interest in it, and a few people that have wanted to buy it, but uh, so far no one that's, uh, and we haven't marketed it heavily yet. Um, we still want to complete the, um, the yard, and we did include um, the kitchen appliances that were installed last week, um, but, um, but to date, you know, we haven't had anyone that's come through that's met the income requirements yet.
household could only make forty-five thousand. Now they could make seventy-three. And oh, okay. Okay. Is there any questions? Okay. Uh, if we're no more questions, they're asking us to adopt resolution twenty ten, please. Support a uh, motion. Yes. Support. We have a motion. We have support. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? Motion carried. Number fifteen. Letter, letter from Megan regarding a proposed donation of three fifty West Pearl Street to the city of Coldwater. Megan or Keith? Sure. Um, about a month ago, we were approached by Dennis Show, and he uh, indicated that he and his two brothers, Bernard and James, were interested in giving a small parcel of land at the intersection of Jay and West Pearl to the city. Their dad had purchased this from someone who had purchased it at a, a tax foreclosure sale in the early 2000s, and the three brothers inherited it in 2006. It's about a tenth of an acre. It's got no structures on it, although it does have an easement for, I believe, wastewater? Stormwater. Stormwater. Stormwater drain on it. Um, it is, as I say, a tenth of an acre. It's uh, SEV indicates a total cash, true cash value of about $5,000. It is not a big tax par parcel. I think that last year's taxes were about $19 for 2013. And uh, we wanted to bring this to you to make the decision. It is not a really a particularly buildable par property, but it might be useful someday for realigning the road or something of that nature. Well, since we already have the storm, there's already a storm structure on the property that would hinder or limit what it could be used for, and it is at the intersection of Pearl and Jay that um, we would be willing to accept it, and they're not seeking any compensation. Give something more for Dave. Or more for Dave to vote. Yeah. I'll spend that tax money really fast. Who owns the other point here? The little triangle right across the street from the one that. We'll we find out. But I no, don't I don't think we have a chance. Yeah, that. This, okay. That's city right there. Oh, that's city. Yes. Yeah, really, okay. So this Ferrari mall on that. There have been discussions internally, and we've actually applied for a grant safety grant to do realignment of Pearl Street, US 12, and Mill Street, and whether or not we could abandon that section in there. Yeah, one, we already have these storm structures. We occupy the property in one way already with the storm structure, too. Um, it would add flexibility, and if we were to want to realign Pearl, if we abandoned that area, we swap it yeah, for take on these that range properties. We could that's a flexibility there. Yeah. So, well, the landowner could just quit paying tax and it basically come to us or anyway. Oh, well, eventually. Yeah. Potentially. Yeah. Well, even under that scenario, we probably, unless, it, unless there were no bids on it, we'd have to pay something for it. So. I move to approve the resolution and the agreement. Okay. Support. Motion. We have support. Any final questions? All in favor, please say aye. Aye. We oppose. Two motion carried. Number 16, we've all been waiting for a presentation of the 2019 <laughs> annual belief <laughs> report by Joe Shrive. Thank you, Director. Yeah. Very good. And, yeah. You need a bodyguard? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Council. Thanks for the opportunity to come and present uh, the year uh, closing report for the uh, police department. I uh, brought Deputy Chief Beeman with me, and uh, he might help me out from time to time if I get stuff. So. Anyways, uh, I'd like to cover here one of the things I thought I was about to cover. Um, if you notice the photo, um, that photo that the police officer was taken on November 4th out of Heritage Park. Um, one of the things I wanted to do when I first got started was have an organizational meeting and get all the members of the police department in one place. Um, for you not real familiar with the schedule of the police department, that almost never happens. <laughs> Uh, we pass each other. Um, we, you know, offer 24/7 service all year long. Um, but I thought it was going to be very important to get everybody at the same place so we could kind of uh, reach some goals and some direction that we we're going to head um, in the future. So uh, I'm not a historian in the room, but Randall, um, I think this is the biggest uh, photo of 
Core police department personnel that have been able to find in one group. So, yeah. um, and Deputy Chief Beaver took the photo for us, and he did some pretty fancy camera work to get the camera set up, and then Robin jump in the photo. So, I thought that turned out pretty well. So, the next slide um, is uh, when I first uh, kind of took charge and I started really looking at things. Um, I uh, realized that our vision statement, our mission statement, and some of the things that we uh, uh, we're working on for pretty old and dated, and I wanted to try to update those and make sure I got those out to staff. Um, and so I was actually up at an FBI training, and anybody looks at a lot of FBI websites, you might see some very close similarities to this. Um, and I kind of uh, borrowed some of their formatting that they use. And so, um, you know, we push this out to staff, and we're going to be regularly pushing this stuff out to the, the, the staff. You know, obviously, the vision statement is where we're going. The mission statement is uh, how we get there, and then the strategic policies and the core values are, uh, you know, the tools that we're using to try to get there. Uh, these are the things that we kind of came up with that I thought were going to be important um, as we move into the future of the police department. Unfortunately, my daughter was helping me out with this PowerPoint, and I let her take a look at it, and she said this slide is way too boring and it should be um, better. But, uh, she marked me down a little bit for that one. So. <laughs> and moving forward. So, the next slide, um, I want to talk a little bit about staffs, and I, I, I put together obviously a much more uh, complete uh, report that you guys have access to. This is kind of a presentation, but this is kind of an overview of the criminal complaints throughout the year. Um, and if you look, um, there's kind of a couple of unique things in there that I, I kind of predicted probably would happen. First is the narcotics uh, violation going from 2018 to 2019. We obviously saw a big decrease, and that's um, obviously a direct kind of correlation to the decriminalization of marijuana. Um, one of the things that we have seen still in the narcotics, that we're still seeing a lot of methamphetamines, and we're still seeing a lot of heroin in our community. Um, it's a little bit unique because the methamphetamines, we're not seeing meth labs like we used to, but um, <coughs> methamphetamines is being kind of brought in um, through some of the cartels and is kind of taking place from marijuana because the some of the cartels, marijuana is not a real lucrative business for them anymore because of the legalization of the United States. So uh, that was kind of interesting to see the drop there. The next thing is uh, we saw a pretty big increase in auto thefts. Um, that was kind of a direct correlation to one suspect who had been involved in stealing many cars. Uh, we were able to um, actually apprehend him and he's uh, currently um, uh, incarcerated. Um, but he was kind of on a little mini spree there where he stole um, several cars kind of back to back in kind of a real quick succession. Um, a couple other things you notice like the accidents are pretty much stable across the board. Uh, total number of calls for service are pretty stable across the board. Um, and uh, uh, as far as that goes. Um, one thing you notice down in the, the, the part where it talks about the increase and decrease of crime, a couple of those ones that have real big numbers or real big jumps is because they were normally really small related crimes like the homicides and the, the arsons in some of those cases. Uh, we don't normally deal with a ton of those types of complaints. So when you have, you know, a, a click there, sometimes it makes the, um, the statistics a little bit skewed. So that takes us over to the next slide, if you could show So this is kind of a, a kind of a, a shows you a kind of graph of uh, the history of complaints and where they've been. Um, you basically have three different types of complaints that the police department deals with. Uh, we deal with total calls of service, which is the gray line at the top, um, non-criminal complaints, which is the orange line. Those are complaints that uh, we respond to, but we normally don't end up with some type of criminal prosecution, We're normally writing a very intensive report. And then the criminal complaints at the bottom of the blue. Um, and so you can see statistically across, you know, since 2010 to 2019, uh, crime and the number of calls of service that we've had at the uh, uh, Fort Police Department have been pretty stable. And uh, you know, this year we had a, a slight increase in uh, calls of service, but um, it's, a, it's pretty stable across the board. Sometimes I find it very interesting that the, the stats and some of the things come out as close as they do from time to time, from year to year. So um, take us into the, the highlights of 2019. So 2019, these are some of the things we accomplished at the police department. Uh, we got a new door access, uh, electronic door access uh, program installed. Uh, this is really big for us because we had some old push button syntax locks that had been there since the original building of the building. 
one of the major problems with that was every time an employee left, we had to either change the code, or we also had to learn a new code, and it was getting to be you know, pretty expensive at times to have the locks that come back and reset that. So that was a, a great opportunity, and it's uh, working well. We were able to um, upgrade and get a new canine uh, patrol dog. Um, his name is Havoc. Um, he's a, a Belgian Malinois. Uh, one of the really good things about this uh, was uh, he is not trained in marijuana. Um, there was going to be a lot of arguments and discussion whether a dog had been trained in marijuana. You could, you know, kind of de-classify um, that dog in marijuana. That, that basically everybody said that that's basically impossible to take that owner out. Um, and so that's, that was a good thing. Also, this dog is actually a full patrol narcotics dog, which means he can do like building searches, some apprehension work, where our um, first canine, um, or was just a black lab, he was a tracking um, narcotics dog. So that was a good thing. Um, another thing we did in 2019 was uh, we did uh, some specialized training in de-escalation. Um, you know, over time we do a lot of training on PPST and defensive attacks and use of force thing, but we've never really done a lot of specialized training in de-escalation. Um, a lot of times our police officers, they go to situations where things are emotionally charged. Um, you know, everybody is kind of maybe the worst point of their lives, and it's really we want to focus on trying to make sure our police officers are trying to de-escalate and, and, and slow situations down um, and try to make the best decisions there. Um, and then the last thing, um, we went through and basically updated all of our uh, process for tracking for use of forces and plates and administrative laws. One of the things that we are now doing, um, we are actually tracking every use of force up to compliant handcuffing. Uh, so every time that uh, we come in contact somebody where we put handcuffs on them, uh, we do a um, form and we I've uh, got that through the MML, and some of the insurance people were uh, kind of highly recommended it. Um, it's really went pretty smoothly, um, and it gives us a lot better kind of a, a, kind of a uh, sense of where we are and uh, that type of uh, use of force situations. So um, then we move into projects for 2020. These are some of the things that uh, uh, when I uh, first took over the director position, I discussed with the <coughs> manager and kind of plans that I'd like to see the department move in. Um, one of the first things we uh, talked about that I really like to do when we kind of had the wheels kind of turning on this as a school resource officer position. Um, through partnering with the Colorado schools, we realized at any given time, uh, once the new school we built, there'd be close to 3,000 kids uh, over a pretty um, dense area of our community. Uh, we are regularly up there right now on uh, the vaping issues, marijuana in the schools, sexting, truancy, reckless drivings, larcenies. Uh, we, we pretty much respond there for a pretty wide array of uh, complaints. Uh, we feel that having a school resource officer embedded in the school system will help open lines of communication and will really do a better service to make sure that uh, kids in our community have a safe place to go. And uh, we're really looking forward to that. Uh, another thing we're uh, trying to move forward with is body cameras. Uh, ever since I believe, uh, became a police officer in 1996, we've had in-car cameras. Um, I think you're probably one of the actually first police departments in the, the state of Michigan to go to in-car cameras. We actually had these old VCRs and you put in the VCR tape and pull it out. Um, and so we are uh, um, looking at moving forward with body cameras. We really think that will do a really good job of helping protect our officers to, you know, that when people come in and make, um, you know, accusations, we can do a better job of getting a true picture of what actually occurred there. And it also will be very helpful for potentially for uh, prosecution of uh, you know, criminal events. You have more evidence and, and a better opportunity to put together the best criminal cases you can. Um, so we, just, we see that there's a lot of positives in that area. Um, and we're trying to move forward with that. Another unique situation, um, currently we have five female sworn police officers. We have um, five civilian um, uh, employees for we have a female firefighter, and then we have a female reserve officer. Um, and so we have had more uh, females working for the police department, the fire department, and the public safety buildings in my entire career here. And so we kind of outgrown our uh, locker room, and so we're really looking to try to um, get to a, uh, a, a bigger locker room that will give better access for everybody. And so we're really trying to um, build that in the future. A couple other things that we're looking at doing are uh, going through the MACP's uh, accreditation process. 
uh, the accreditation process of the MACP came out a couple years ago. It uh, is a kind of scaled down version of CALEA. Uh, CALEA is an accreditation system that's really meant for police departments greater than 50. Um, MACP is, is came one that's a little bit uh, scaled down and uh, they have like 120 proofs. Uh, but it really makes sure that your police department is using the best policy and the best practice and it brings in other people to kind of audit you or look at your policies, make sure you're doing the best we can. And a kind of a piece of that is the Power DMS. Power DMS is a software that's kind of specifically designed to help uh, with the accreditation process and tracking of policies and all that type of stuff. So that's the kind of the goals we're looking to try to accomplish um, and uh, as we move forward. The next slide. Um, Community outreach, and I'll go through these pretty quickly because I know Mr. Buck said to keep it short and I feel like I might be running on a time frame, but um, community outreach. I truly believe that community outreach, outreach is the most of, uh, important part of our police department. Um, it gets us out in the public, it gets our police, police officers the opportunity to know people in the public, it also gets people in the public opportunity to know our police officers. It makes us uh, real humans rather than just people in a uniform. So some of the things we've been um, taking part with is the shop with the cops. Uh, program, uh, been involved with that for I think the last five years, four years, um, and that's been a great program to help kids in our community. Uh, you know, we have officers that are stopping, helping try to people uh, clear snow um, and uh, different things like that. Um, if you go to the next slide, uh, we have officers that uh, we had uh, Officer Craig Border went down to uh, Trine University and was at a symposium down there talking about uh, women in law enforcement. Uh, and that uh, culturally, how much that's changed just in my career, the numbers of uh, women in law enforcement is growing, which is a, it's a good thing. Um, we do community presentations. We've done them for the Branch County Realtors, the community, uh, for our community schools, and Fence Source Pines, uh, and a wide range of other ones. A lot of things we're getting asked for, um, or they really want, is help in setting up active shooter uh, programs. Uh, you know, it's obviously every time there's an active shooter type incident. Uh, people start reviewing their policies, their procedures, and they really want to know how will the police department respond, what type of resources will we bring to the table for active shooters. So we, we really um, do a lot of that, um, and we do really a wide range. A couple other things you seen, one of the officers um, was uh, up for Military Appreciation Day, and then uh, we also been going down to Career Day and talking to the OJT kids. And that really plays into kind of recruitment of uh, some of the younger kids that are coming up in law enforcement um, as we move forward. Um, next thing, United Way. Um, if you've seen this fall, a lot of the guys uh, grew beards. Uh, one of the things with growing beards, we did as a fundraiser to help donate for Shop the Cop and also United Way. And uh, we did uh, No Shave uh, November and Don't Shave December. And we were able to raise uh, quite a few funds and help uh, put money back in the community. Uh, we had a, uh, a gentleman from the uh, Kauai area that wanted to remain anonymous, came in and donated a bunch of teddy bears. We had those in our control cars, and we've been passing them out to kids um, that uh, maybe are not having the best day, um, that maybe they've been involved in a situation. A little bit trying to humanize us, and also maybe when the kids have a really bad day, uh, make them a little better. Um, you guys heard about the handle of care quite a bit already, um, but that's something we're still partaking in, and, and the, as we move in the future, we'll keep kind of moving forward. Um, takes us to the next slide. Um, patrol scenario days. Um, we've been sending officers up to KCC. Um, this is a, kind of another method that, that we're looking at for recruitment. Um, they've invited us up and we help in their academy. Um, our OJT officers, our, yeah, our, doing OJT. our FTO officers have been going up there and it gives us an opportunity to meet some of the people in the academy and it also helps us um, you know, kind of talk a little bit about the Florida Police Department and, and give us a foot in up there with some of the kids that are going through the academy a little bit. Uh, we participated in Real Man uh, Re, uh, probation full ch uh, checkups. Uh, we did a couple of cleanups down at the park. We're actually getting ready to do another one in the Methodist Church. Uh, coming up here in about a month um, to go down and partake in some of the community events that are going on. So that kind of just takes down to the change in the guard. Um, you know, Director Bartel after 37 years of service. Um, that has left. In uh, 2019, I took over as the acting director, uh, and we kind of keep moving forward in that direction. Um, Deputy Chief Beeman, um, we promoted from lieutenant to uh, deputy chief in November 2019. Um, he's been um, 
do a really good job of that uh, role. Thank you, Pat. Um, three new officers we hired. We offered uh, Officer Brian Regan, Officer Sarah Gunnerman, and Officer Greg Moore. Um, they're all currently through their FTO process. They're out on the road working now currently in our community. Um, all of them are doing a, a very good job, um, been very well received, um, have very diverse different backgrounds, um, different life experiences, but that's one of the things I think is, will help make our police department a better uh, police department future is uh, some diversity. Um, not the, the, the real quick, Kathy Buster also left our uh, thing. But, so that takes us to the next thing, the diversity. Um, our police department right now is, is probably the is for sure the most diverse uh, group we've had working in the city of Polar in my experience here. Um, we promoted a female sergeant. We have two um, direct Yemenese Arabic uh, people that have grown up in our Polar Police Department. Um, they're now working for us. We have a third that's a reserve officer working for us. And uh, you know, uh, nobody in our police department has, has hesitated at all. It's been kind of full speed ahead moving forward. Um, and one of the things we did to try to um, behind that, we formed a uh, rec soccer team. And uh, well, some of us, our soccer skills are not as good as others, but we went down and we had some fun, and there's some pictures of the uh, um, guys out there trying to play soccer, some are a little better than others. But we did win our championship of the thing, next to a, a goal by one of our a very veteran police officers. It ended up in a shootout, and it was a, I'll tell you the story a more time, it was a very good thing. So the last uh, couple slides here are just kind of some um, stuff I wanted to make sure I thank uh, Director Bartel. Uh, for you know his years of service and also kind of being a mentor to me, um, he uh, helped me out numerous times in my career. Um, I, I definitely would not have made it to where I am without his help and his support. So I wanted to make sure I acknowledge and thank him. And then the last two slides. So um, for you guys that didn't know, I've actually taught classes at KCC um, as an adjunct professor in law enforcement, and I teach a class on ethical problem solving. And one of the things we talked about was a guy by the name of Robert Peel, who wrote uh, the Metropolitan Police, Metropolitan Police Act of 1829. And he really, these are some of the very fundamental policies of law enforcement. And I always look back at them at times when I try to figure out which way we should go. And uh, one of the things that he talked about is the police are truly the only service that are out there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, that are looking out for the safety of the community. And our police officers currently are getting more and more uh, things kind of, you know, uh, offloaded on them, whether it's mental health issues, homeless issues, you know, uh, substance abuse issues, um, the social media intensity of some of the things there. And so um, I just, you know, think it's very important we realize that that group that's out there is the, is the group that is trying to make our community a safe place to, to live and work and raise our kids. And I think that's very important. And then the, the goal, the last slide here, one of our appeals um, policies or says, recognize always the test of police eventually is the absence of crime and disorder, not the visible evidence of police action in dealing with it. And I think that's really fitting, that's really the goal that you know, I want to try to promote as a police department, is I want this to look like a very safe place. I want it to be very free from you know, crime and disorder. And I don't want it to look like a police officer standing on every corner, you know, watching over the top of everybody. So, you know, these are the kind of things that, you know, I'm really trying to promote in our police department and kind of the goal moving forward. With that, I will open up the questions for anybody that has any questions for the director. I've got to tell you, I think Director uh, Fire Chief Schultz last month and your report today have been two of the best uh, updates we've had in many years. And uh, I think on behalf of council, I, I thank you all. I think mean, you know you have our support. I would like to ask, since you brought security with you, I'd like to ask uh, Officer Bob Beeman if he has any uh, comments he'd like to add. You've been an important part of this community for a lot of years. Do you have any uh, observations? I don't have anything to add to what the director has said. I'm just uh, happy to be here to do my service. Yeah. We appreciate it. We appreciate all thank you guys do all So uh, if there's no other questions, uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. No for a
land acquisition. So if we're so inclined to do that, we need a motion and it would be a roll call vote to go into closed session. So moved. Support. Could we take the vote? Yes. 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 Yes.